just hand over to you again and Sally, welcome. Oh, hi. Um, I just want to welcome everyone, um, all the midwives across the world and student midwives that are listening at the moment. Um, let me know if you can't hear yeah, down on myself throughout the, um, throughout the presentation, but we'll try our best. There's uh, two of us here giving the presentation, so um, we'll try our best for you to be able to hear both of us. Um, I'll pass over to Dan. Hi everyone, happy International Week Day. I've just come fresh knowing a life or mortality thing. Just had a baby at 10 past 11 and it's about 12 o'clock now I think, so rushing to get here for this important time to share with other midwives. So um, first we'd just like to acknowledge this year's International Midwives Day and um, we're, we're pretty excited here at Mama. We're having a celebration straight after this this afternoon. So we'll have a, a great celebration this afternoon for all the midwives across the world. We just wanted to give you a little bit of background um, to start with on Dan and myself and um, who we are and where we came from. So I'm, I'm the younger of the two um, in the photo. My name's Kelly Langford and I've been a midwife for six years now. Um, and I started my journey um, training through uh, Bachelor of Midwifery and Nursing combined. And then I did two years in a public hospital and then I was mentored out into private practice by Dan um, and another midwife. And um, a year and a half ago we started a practice together called Mama. So um, that's a little bit about me, and I'll pass on to Dan for a bit about her. Uh, well, I'm the old one, of course, and um, I've been around uh, Melbourne forever. I started at the Queen Victoria Hospital, which is no longer there, and um, I'm, so I'm a monarch girl. Uh, my daughter's a midwife, and they're monarch girls, and that's very nice. Um, I met Kelly and fell in love with her as a midwife straight away, and um, knew that we could make a practice together. And we have, and um, we've made the first um, clinic really in Victoria, I suppose. Um, it's been quite interesting, uh, yeah, but that's me. And I'm going to work here until it succeeds. Um, I drop dead or I retire. So we'll just go to the next slide for you. Um, <laughs> ah, here we go. Uh, so that's who we are and where we came from and how we got here. So just a little bit of background about um, where we come from or where we're practicing in. We're in Australia, right down the bottom in um, Victoria. And um, there's, as you can see, and these are a bit old these statistics, but um, in 2009, in, uh, from 72,400 births in Victoria, the um, majority of them were planned public hospital births, um, 67%, and then 30% about private, planned private hospital births. Um, we don't have many birth centres left in Victoria, so um, that percentage is not there, but it's um, a very small percent as well. And only 284 women uh, were planned home birth. Um, and there's only a couple of small group practices in Victoria who, who practice home birth. Mm -hmm. Maternity care options are for women in Victoria. Uh, midwife in public hospitals, uh, medical care in public hospitals, one-to-one -one registry in public hospitals, and shared care with GPs um, birth in a public hospital, shared care with midwives birth in a public hospital. The shared care actually is a little clear there because um, it's antenatal care only, not postnatal care and not birth. Um, uh, private um, obstetricians in private hospitals, we can't get into private hospitals, uh, only as support people. Private obstetricians in public hospitals, that's um, actually a big conundrum in Victoria or in Melbourne at the moment. Uh, it's very hard for uh, private uh, practitioners uh, obstetricians included to get um, access to the public goods. Um, it's a big problem. I think there's five in most of our big hospitals. Uh, care in public hospitals support from private midwives. Is this about us? So as, um, as midwives, there's about eight of us and 
we do all these um, all these models of care, um, and probably people come we've been come to know been known to people as home birth midwives. We try very hard not to wear the hat. We try to wear the hat of being midwife uh, number one, and um, to sort of make a, a mother care based on a woman's centered or partnership approach to her her family, the community, etc. needs. So um, when we started out the venture to um, start a midwifery centre, it was one of the reasons that we started was because in Australia in 2010 we got access to Medicare rebates, which meant that midwifery care was a lot more accessible to uh, women and families um, across Australia. So we jumped on board pretty quickly and Dan and I were one of the first or two of the first midwives to get Medicare in Victoria, so we were pretty keen. Um, and then we started on the journey to find a midwifery centre that was um, centrally located and big enough to suit our needs. We were sort of looking for a cottage with wisteria and leg light windows and sort of a little, a little, you know, beautiful little path leading up to a beautiful door that opened with the sun shining through it. Instead, we found this really big ugly building. But the really big ugly building that we found turned out to be quite practical for us. So we went um, we went along with it and got a whole lot of our clients and friends and family down for a few weeks in a row and um, knocked down some walls and put up some other walls and painted this, this huge um, ten room centre that we're now in. Um, it's a, a property that we're leasing from the council so the, the price suits us um, as well. And um, so once we found the premises, we really needed to go about um, getting everything in place to get some other midwives working with us. Um, so we started to get uh, get other midwives what we call eligible, so that's getting them ready for um, practicing with Medicare. And um, under, what you can see there under the heading for Medicare, MPR is the Midwifery Practice Review. It's the way that we um, can review our practice with uh, the Australian College of Midwives um, and insurance is another essential for a private practitioner. Um, we also needed to establish some strong relationships with DC obstetricians and obstetricians in setting up the centre because as part of um, women accessing Medicare rebates, they need to have an arrangement, we need to have an arrangement with a doctor for that woman's care for them to be able to access the rebate. So, that's been a big part of setting up the centre as well, is establishing the, the relationships. And then, of course, um, we needed some women, some clients. So we've, um, we've been out there in the community um, telling women who we are and who midwives are and what we can do for them. And in the last couple of years, it's, women are really catching on what midwives can do for them today. One of the reasons... One of the reasons we chose Kensington in um, Melbourne was because it was inner city and it was near the big hospital. And we also were pretty keen on helping the women from the Horn of Africa in the, um, the flats, the um, housing commission flats, which uh, there's a few of them here. Sadly, we've only had one um, uh, housing commission uh, home birth client, so that was absolutely fabulous and we're definitely going there for more. We've just posted signs up in the flats in what's the name? In Somali. <laughs> to say, um, come and meet us um, over at Mama, we want to be with you when you have your baby. So we hope that's going to um, take off. Kelly has done a great job with getting people eligible for their, um, uh, el to become eligible midwives. And um, I think I've got a big client base over here. Now our client base this year is mainly from around this area, which is fantastic. So we'll go on to the next slide. Oh, um, just one before that, actually. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Someone doesn't want to watch it. Here's a picture of our centre. We've got a banner up here with all the alternative services on it. And we spent um, a lot of time and... and uh, using our friends to get the signage right and we're pretty proud of the signage. Um, the, the allied health professionals who um, 
uh, work with us. Uh, we have a psychologist, a counsellor, an acup or a couple of acupuncturists, two massage um, therapists, a uh, chiropractor. Uh, we have yoga and um, Chinese medicine, homeopathy and naturopathy available at the centre. Uh, we also hire out spaces for students. We have meditation and, and lots of childhood education um, here. And we're also uh, having people um, popping in and having the odd baby or two. Um, so the centre, as you can see in that picture, is quite large. There's a downstairs and an upstairs section. We've got ten rooms for consulting, one large room that we do yoga and education classes in, um, a room for breastfeeding that's just got five lovely recliner chairs, um, an outdoor space. Uh, that we've got a garden where we grow some lovely herbs and um, things for breastfeeding, um, and a uh, car park, which has got 10 spaces as well, so it's really accessible to women. Um, let's go on to the next one. Yeah. I think we've started here, uh, we've been at some, um, we've been privileged to get 250 um, births, and this is only a well, 18 months, I think. 40% um, of them have been home birth, 40% um, shared care, and um, birth support in public and private hospitals, um, you know, the rest. The um, home, birth, home births have doubled in Victoria since we started. If, when the statistics come out next year, you'll see they've doubled. Uh, I think there's a bit of a trend anyway. A lot of the midwives in Victoria have been going to court and um, people have been saying that home birth is like been going to court for not so pleasant things, but then they thought, well, we didn't know you could have a home birth, and they went to We didn't know you could have a home birth, but we saw some home birth midwives that go to court. So it's funny, isn't it? Any publicity is better than none, sort of. Uh, people will really, really come to us a lot for home birth, and we, we think that if we had access to public hospitals, that wouldn't happen. We think if, we, if mum and midwives um, could um, access the Medicare um, item number and use the public hospitals for birth, that uh, we would have many more hospital births. But one of the most exciting things that we've found from our, our statistics um, across the last couple of years is that no matter where the woman chooses to have her baby, whether it's a home birth or in a private or public hospital, if one of the mum and midwives is with her, we have very similar outcomes across the board, which is really exciting. It really shows that it's not the place of birth, but it's the, the caregivers that make a big difference. Um, yes, navigating Medicare has been one of our biggest challenges um, going in, into starting the centre and, and using the Medicare rebate. There's been a little bit of discussion on um, that people have been talking about what um, what Medicare rebates we can use and in, in Australia we've got um, access to Medicare rebates for antenatal birth and postnatal care in theory um, but in Victoria so far no one can access the birth rebate because you need to be the uh, primary carer in a public hospital and at the moment no midwife in Victoria has visiting rights in public hospitals. It is a lot easier in um, in more rural settings where the midwives and um, the hospitals work very closely together. Um, but in a big place like Victoria, we've found it very, very challenging to get into the hospitals and, and discuss how we would benefit um, their services as well as how they would benefit ours. So um, the birth rebate is, still seems like it's a way off in Victoria, um, in, in central Victoria anyway. Um, the antenatal and postnatal rebates would be very well there. Well, I was reading the messages. <laughs> um, Medicare um, has also given us a lot of power, though. You know, I, I was of two minds about Medicare, but if I could get money for um, our services, if women could get money, I just thought it just had to be done. But we actually don't get Medicare, the women do, and I think that's a fantastic thing. And, I'm all for it now, but it really does give you power to say the provider number and that you can give Medicare rebates. And it really is making you briefly, you know, stand up and be accountable. Um, 
Um, the the next challenge that we've had um, was rising to the challenge of collaboration. Uh, so when Medicare rebates first came out in Australia, it was a big um, challenge for people to understand what this collaboration meant. And in theory, it means that midwives and doctors will work together to um, to get good care for women um, and work in a, in a collaborative re relationship for the best outcome for the woman. Um, but in some situations, it sort of turned out as a, a bit of a, um, I guess, for want of a better word, a bit of a power struggle for um, doctors feeling like if they sign off a collaborative agreement with a midwife, they might be somehow responsible for, for the care that the midwife gives, whereas it really should be that um, that it just creates a pathway for that midwife to refer on to a doctor if they see that they need to do that. So the only way that women can get Medicare rebates is to have this uh, collaborative arrangement with a doctor going on. Um, but as we've gone on the last year and a half or close to, to coming up to two years in September um, for the Midwestry Centre here, it's, um, it's something that the word is getting out and we're getting a lot more collaborative arrangements in place. Mostly they're collaborative, um, collaborative arrangements with DPs, um, DP obstetricians and private obstetricians. And for the last year or so, we've had a DP obstetrician that's worked at the centre here with us. Um, and so he's been great to provide that, that referral process for us. We have um, collaboration with hospitals in the antenatal period, uh, but we haven't had success in, in any other area. I think I see a lot of people are talking things about Medicare equals rules. Oh, I agree. And uh, CMC guidelines equals rules. And, um, you know, your driver's license equals rules. And I don't know, everything equals rules. But if we do have these rules and we think they're fair and we, we, we're in partnership with women with the rules, um, you can use them to your advantage. Uh, for instance, if, um, just recently, the Victorian Charter of Human Rights, you know, the rules in that, we can use them to our advantage. So it, just by complying to some rules, um, as long as they're not going against women's wishes, I think it's okay this Medicare thing. I'm sorry to see everyone so sort of uptight about it, but I think it's just resistance to change, which I've been an expert in. Um, but I think uh, rules, rules can be... Um, yeah, knowledge can be power and rules can be power too if used correctly. So in um, in Melbourne, we've got three tertiary centres um, that take on a, a varying amount of clients at the women's hospital in one aspect, somewhere up around 7,500 women per year that go through there. And I think the Mercy is given far off that. Um, so they're big um, tertiary centres. And we now have shared care with uh, two of them, the women's hospital and Monash Medical Centre. Uh, and we're very, very far off having shared care with the Mercy Hospital for Women because they're an extremely conservative um, hospital and they seem to be the last to jump on board with with any big change like this. I can't say much about the Mercy Hospital. Um, they have excellent um, uh, nursery facilities and they really um, encourage breastfeeding. That's nice. But the, the Mercy Hospital, um, as far as midwives go and, and helping us with midwives and helping the women who want to work with us at the institution, it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been forthcoming in any way whatsoever. So we put the same energy into negotiating with Women's Hospital, Monash and the Mercy and um, we've been opened, uh, we've been welcomed at the Women's Hospital, at the Monash Hospital in the capacity of care, care practitioners, but the Mercy Hospital has actually slammed the door on us. Um, I see there on the downfall that Scott Midwife not wanting to work on call. I don't think it's just midwives not wanting to work on call. I think it's the perceived or the actual change in lifestyle that comes with working in that model care. As a mother of uh, many children, 
as a futurist and as a, a midwife in a birth bed, I've never done anything but be on call, so it, it is part of my life. But watching um, Kelly struggle with it and then watching other midwives um, say, oh, they'll, they'll come and work with it, they're not be on call, you see that it is a problem. And I think that um, case load is there with, with it. case load is done, case load which is handled properly, and I think there's a better way to do case load than it's done anywhere. And I think that the individuals within the caseload model should put stuff in the hat what they would like to do and what they could do. For instance, um, someone might like to be on call five nights a week and someone else only on one a week. People actually like to do that sometimes, but it's so prescriptive, uh, all this on call. In fact, what do you pay for on call? How do you do that? That's, that's been a real um, downfall. The other downfall, um, which isn't up there, has been people coming in and soaking up everything they've got to offer and then leaving and going off um, on their own, which we encourage, of course, midwife in our own businesses. So that's been really hard to swallow at times. And now on to our triumph. <laughs> so I think the, the biggest and best, I think we both agree that the biggest thing that we've achieved is that there's so many more women now speaking out and knowing what midwifery care is. Um, and that's purely just from getting out there, being at all the big horrible baby shows and um, all of the places we don't like to go, but just getting midwifery care and midwives out there um, has been a big part of what we've done. Um, and just increasing the awareness about midwives. One-to-one um, -one support is something that we offer, but of course we always have a backup midwife, so it's, um, you know, practically it always, they always get a midwife that they know, um, and that it's not the place of birth that makes the, the biggest difference to the outcomes, it's that, that the woman is supported um, in her decision making and um, supported to birth the way that she wants to, wherever she wants to. Um, and I think with the midwives that have been working with us and for us have had increased job satisfaction. I know that for Dan and myself in the last year and a half or two years it's been there's been many, many challenges that aren't to do with midwifery necessarily. They're more to do with um, running a business and starting at the first centre in Victoria and all of the challenges that come with those things that have sort of pushed us to the limits but I know that whenever either of us go to a, a beautiful birth or, or support a woman to achieve what she wants to do at any point, we just we get back to what we love doing and we're, we're happy. So we do have increased job satisfaction. So we almost come to the end of our, our um, official presentation, but I think there'll be there might be plenty of um, time for discussion and we can answer some questions as well. Um, yeah, let, let, let's go from just the two of us. Um, uh, the, the two of us last year uh, were at 120 births together and it's, just, it's unmanageable, you can't maintain it and um, uh, we're pouring all the money back into the centre of course. Now we've got eight midwives. We've got many more women attending. We've got clinics in three locations and a rural one as well in Dalesford in Victoria. And we've got student nurse placements, international uh, student midwives coming in and uh, having placements with us. And people are starting to know us. We would like to be more involved um, with the ACM and, and the ANF and, and bodies like that. We realise that we, we need to know a lot about what happens in the infrastructure in health in Victoria and we're learning at a great pace. We've learned a lot about politicians but there's no time to talk about that, thank goodness, now. And we really, our whole thing is that every woman knows that she can um, find a midwife and that um, she can get some help from the federal government to pay for that midwife. Our plans for the future are to, you know, embrace um, we just see in Victoria even more and to embrace the graduate midwives and, and the young midwives and, and to really um, work with women in partnership to get something going. Uh, we've had 50, 56 babies this year and one of those uh, was an emergency, or two now, two of those were emergency seizures. And um, uh, 50 of them were uh, normal for going to live in. 
has got to say something. It's got to say something. We last year we had one complaint, and this year I don't think we'll have one yet. Okay, thanks for listening. We we'll go to the questions now. Oh, happy international list on this last day. <laughs> so, um, Maxine asked us to share the statistics on place of birth um, and how they they haven't been influenced, um, how they haven't influenced their outcomes. So, as we said before, we've got about um, a bit less than for about forty percent um, home birth rate at the moment, um, and the less. Uh, 60% in public or private hospitals. So the the big statistics, I guess, that people want to know about are things like um, the VN rate, feedback rate. Um, so see the rate across the board in the um, public and private system is somewhere around 30 to 50 percent. But with um, with women in a, with us involved in the women's care, it's somewhere around 10 to 15 percent, and that was in our first. Yeah, statistics. Um, stillbirth? Oh, I haven't. Yeah. Uh, Zero stillbirth, right? <laughs> not that we mind. We'd be very privileged to work with people having stillbirth, of course. Um, we, we, we do like that we work with um, people with miscarriages. We, we don't say come and see the 12 weeks. So I'll come and see the things. You've got the two lines. We'd love to see you. And um, our other statistics. Uh, in the private hospitals, it's a private obstetrician, selective of course, selective private obstetrician. Freemasons Hospital welcomes us with open arms. They have pools in all their bathrooms now, you know, we can take our pools in. And they're very um, inclusive of um, uh, private midwives. Unfortunately, they make you sign a thing to say you only need support person. I just sign it. Um, but that's made a big difference. And the obstetricians uh, who do work with us are very happy uh, that they have, we're having normal birth in the private hospital. That's about it. Um, so, so uh, uh, Denise, can you hang Do you mind having a verbal question? No, that's it. Uh, Denise, I've enabled your microphone so you can um, ask your question. Denise is a home birth midwife in New Zealand and also heavily involved, oh well, is writing the maternity manifesto in New Zealand at the moment. Um, I'm actually an Australian midwife. I was involved in the community midwifery program in Perth and was an independent practicing midwife in Perth as well. Um, I'm here in New Zealand and uh, because the the political football is only on one level here. There's one national government. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I, my experiences with home birth, when you have a, a large lot of women and everything else, we all, the other thing, is, the thing that comes home is the, the connection, the um, attachment of the baby and the mother and uh, the whole harmony stuff that just doesn't happen when you transfer to hospital or when you're in hospital and you're not nesting and uh, you know the thing is the baby survives all right but as a, as a species we're not thriving and I think midwives really need to look at the whole um, defense of home birth as nesting as true birthing and the other as the option and I'm I just won't come home until we've got home birth Maybe I'll stay here forever at that rate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, we've got questions on the chat board. Um, Dan and Kelly have done nice picked up a couple of them, mostly about the uh, um, and another one about Model, um, oh, so there was a, a question from Chris um, that she'd like to hear more about the case load model because um, she's been on our website. I'll put our website up um, at the end of this as well and, and a contact if anyone wants to contact us. Um, but yes, we do have we do have midwives, local midwives for our um, satellite clinic. So we've got. Um, a uh, midwife down in Elwood um, and in um, and we're also 
also looking down at Clayton and um, up to, at the Carolyn Springs because they're the heavy um, areas and they're also near the hospital where they've got shared care. So we all set up um, practices and and help the midwives get established and, and then we'll get on to another venture. Are there any other questions? Um, everyone's asking where the comment box is. Um, Jen and Kelly, I was going to ask about um, perhaps because there's quite a few student um, midwives on, on today, um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about um, what you sort of do within those placements. Absolutely. So we have done since about, um, since we started last year actually, we've taken on student midwives and we've tried to only take on um, as many students as we can um, facilitate at one time so it's really one student for one midwife. So we usually have a couple of students on at a time and if the students um, are willing to be on call then they can literally just follow us of course as long as the, the women are, are happy with it. They can um, be with us for birth, um, they come to the clinic, whichever clinic they would like to go to for the antenatal and postnatal visit. Um, they can come along to education classes and then whatever um, competencies they need to, to get kicked off, we try and focus on those areas for them. But um, it's a lot slower paced here, obviously, than the hospital. They don't get the numbers that they get in the hospitals. But as far as um, the feedback has gone, they've just loved the experience and learned a whole lot of different things about um, midwifery skills and, and more natural ways to go about things, which is great. Last year we um, tried to get some funding for a graduate um, midwife that we were able to. Next year we're offering two graduate places but we weren't able to um, get any funding either but we're just going to work it out. We're just going to do it. There was a student in the comments um, saying how amazing her placement with you was so that's good to hear. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if anybody else has got any questions. Um, oh, oh, Chris had a follow-up about the, the caseload. Did you see that one about steering caseload? Obviously, maybe about how you back each other up. So with um, Dan and myself and another midwife, um, Kirsty are the, the midwives that are really on call full-time. So we take on um, however many women we, we think we can handle, and I, I suppose it's because we do a lot of support in hospitals um, as well as home birth, the, the load of supporting a woman in hospital and then her um, being cared for postnatally in the first couple of days by the hospital is a bit different to the, the load for um, for women who are having a home birth. So we take on um, however many clients we, we feel like we can eat. And then we've got other midwives that want to do um, part-time on call, so they sort of um, will do a lot more antenatal and postnatal care, but they will also support um, women when they can. So when there's a bit of fragmented care, as Kelly's explaining from our part-time uh, businesses that come through here, because without employment, right, everyone has their own business in them. So what makes up for that is we have a lot of community-based things, or in, in London we have a lot of like coffee mornings, fresh food drop-ins, and um, oh, women just come because they want to see us. <laughs> and we have lunches with them and things like that. So we catch up with our women who um, are birthing with us in many other ways than our paid um, visits. Some of the comments are, are, are saying about how um, Say, say disempowered women are in Australia at the moment. Would you guys have any sort of comments around that and how, I mean, obviously you work, um, you know, really tirelessly to actually make sure women are empowered. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously a hard feeling over there. Look, I, I, I think I would like to comment on that because it's very fresh in our minds at the moment. Um, we see at least one or two women a week 
who want to um, be brief about a traumatic birth experience. We, we keep a psychologist busy here um, twice a week. Um, I think women are totally disempowered by birth in Victoria um, because it's depending on who they get on the day. But we've just had someone just yesterday who got told her nipples don't work, who got told she had to do, she had to do that. I think women are really disempowered um, by birth in Victoria. I really do. Because you know what? Who do they tell? Who do they talk to? If you ring up a hospital and you want to say something, who do you talk to? What do you do? With Kelly and I standing shoulder to shoulder with women, we feel disempowered. It's a real problem and I would like to see something like um, the Eternity Coalition or Consumer Group really take it up again. You know, we used to have it at both 60s, 70s I'm talking about, but you know, we got really on our feminist high heels and said, no, listen to us. We're birthing, listen to us. It's, it's the money that um, the government gives for birthing. We want it. We don't want green books, red books or blue books. We want some power in birth. And I think women are disempowered by birth in Victoria. I'm really sad about that, but every birthing service review will um, tell you that. There's just a question here for Dan, and I'll just get it to read. Is that about from Denise? Yeah. Oh, hi, Denise. Look, um, Denise says, um, are these women going to see the ministers of health? You know, who do you see? I don't even know who to see. I don't even know who to see about why can't I get a, a right in the hospital? You know, the sensibility, all these little clicky things. Who do I ring up to talk to in the ACM? I don't know. Who's ever come here when they're invited? I don't know. The women, um, this uh, Victorian Charter of, of Human Rights in a recent conference about human rights has given me great energy to pursue this. We have Medicare, um, people who don't have Medicare, who we are fighting for them to get um, care in our hospitals without having to pay first type thing. It's really full on, but um, well, we need politici polit politically inclined midwives to help us. Like Liz works in Queensland, she's an absolute gem. I mean, she knows everything about Queensland government. If someone down here knows that about the Victorian government, come and help Kelly and I, because apart from name, there's an ombudsman, and the number I ran up the other day, that lady hasn't been there two years. Like, you know, we need to be active this way, and I really would like to improve our... Um, uh, appearances that way. We just go to the hospital and the hospital tells us and we're so sick of it. And this is probably being taped so I'll still say it. So it's a bloody process. Follow the process. You know, process and policies don't go with, you know, sex and reproductive things. They just don't work. And with birth and breastfeeding and children running around, policies, policies and procedures go out the window. <laughs> what are you looking? Okay. Perhaps we should stand for politics. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> the button sausage kids are like those. I saw a delightful thing I put this wife in a in a magazine saying um where your local midwife supporters and have a stockage as well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really heated, heated discussion. It, it's unfortunate that it seems when women get involved in politics, they leave their uterus at the door. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so they don't seem to be as uh, pro-woman or pro-choice or pro so, um, you know, birth as they might be if they weren't in, in politics. You know, I think we all must realise, I hope this is a big voice out there, but we all should realise how powerful women are. We are the most powerful thing in the world. We need to do. We can do it without men too. We are really powerful things and we need to get into human and do something. Us two little biddies here, we're so tired from doing this, and we've probably done it ask about. But, you know, we can get out there and really make a difference. I would like to walk down the street and say, every woman say, oh my goodness, there's the midwife, how are you going? And everyone's standing on their feet and, you know, really guard their uterus and really work together for um, not being disempowered by 
our actual vision. <sighs> I think you need to be uh, here. I hope that um, everyone knows I'm not a nurse, I've killed someone, but I think the midwife, the midwife is getting more and more low, known. We've just been approached by a, um, a filming company to make a film about midwives. I think midwives are really getting out there. Can you just clarify what you mean about disability insurance and death, Danny? I can just raise your hand, so I'll just enable the microphone. Hang on a second. Yeah, Denise, you can speak now about disability insurance. The uh, Julia Dillard has has been talking about a disability insurance, and my question is, will this act like uh, ACC here in New Zealand? Part of my professional indemnity insurance is that I pay in to ACC for every woman that I look after as a midwife, and so do all the other self-employed midwives in this country. That's how in New Zealand they can afford professional indemnity. We also have a higher levy when we join the College of Midwives, but that is also how they've got self-employed midwives because they see things. So my question is, does the new national in, um, disability insurance look like it might have some impact on say birth injury, for example, and, and therefore on professional indemnity. Well, we haven't really looked at that in, in that depth, but the problem with that, with that new um, disability scheme at the moment that's causing great concern is if that money isn't spent on disability, where does the rest of the money in the bucket go? So I think it's something that, is, that could be looked at. So I don't think it's going to be... Um, in, you know, no one's quite thinking that hasn't happened yet. That's an interesting thing, and we could take that up with our, our politicians. You New Zealand has had so many beautiful things and a beautiful country. It hasn't been, no. Uh, I don't know which Lindell that is, but yes, that's true, Lindell. It hasn't been released yet. But I've been watching that one quite closely because it's such a lot of money. It's such a minority group, and um, it's such an aggressive group, and yes. I think we could probably go on forever talking about what we can do to change and make a better system over there. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys, Ben and Kelly, so much for um, your presentation. It's, it's really great and um, obviously really important to keep, um, you know, really good and to keep the relationships within the mandatory framework um, and obviously keep fighting for um, for women um, in general and in their choice um, around um, what they want their birth to be. Um, yeah, and happy Midwife Day, everyone. <laughs>